Hey everyone, I'm Adam McNeely, and I am a Google Developer Expert for Android, and today I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about caching data with the Apollo Android Library. Right here on this slide you can find my Twitter handle. If you want these slides, go over there. I will have it pinned to my profile when this talk is live. Um, if you're watching a recording, uh, feel free to DM me there and get these slides. I also have a link to them at the very end of the presentation as well. Whenever I give a talk, I like to make sure everyone has the same baseline at the start to make sure we all understand the topic clearly. So if you're unfamiliar with caching, let's talk about what that means. A cache is the storage of data that has been requested previously so that we can serve it faster in the future. So if you have a screen on your app that shows data that's unlikely to have changed, there's no reason to make a new network request every time when we can take the response of that first request, save it, and then surface that for the user um, next time they go visit that same page. And why would we do something like this? Um, well, a faster page load creates a better user experience. There's no need to make the user wait if we can serve them that data faster, and using a cache allows us to do that. Then checking for data on device can also save on networking resources. Over time, making so many network requests will take up more battery life on the phone. Um, but if we can leverage a cache, we can cut down on those resources, and then we create a much better user experience over time in that regard as well. So here's a sample application that we're going to be using as the example for caching. And on the main screen, we see a list of countries that exist. And each time we click on one, we see a detailed page uh, with more information about that country. And in this case, it loads pretty quickly. But you may notice that each time we click on an item, we do briefly see the loading icon um, for each country. But in the perfect world, we request all the information about a country when we load the main page, and when we click on it, it should just be able to pull information from the cache and give us something like this, where each time we click on an item, uh, it just loads seemingly instantly, um, and we don't see a loading icon, or I guess sometimes we do for a brief second, but still very much faster than the previous example. So over the rest of the talk, we're going to go through how we can make this happen for our users. And the Apollo library has two types of caches ready to go for us to implement. The first one is an HTTP cache, and the second one is a normalized cache. We'll talk about the differences between them. The first one that we're going to talk about is the HTTP cache, and we'll talk about that because it's a lot easier to set up, although it does have more limitations. Um, at the bottom, we have a link to the documentation for this. Uh, there's also a second link, which goes to the actual code, which links back to just saying that this um, HTTP cache was actually li actually, list <laughs> actually lifted from the OK HTTP library, which um, Apollo is kind of built on top of. And let's talk about how it works. Um, not like the nitty gritty, but just how does the HTTP cache work other than storing data for us to retrieve faster. Well, it does that by using a file directory on the device, and then with each request, we're going to generate a unique key for the cache, some key that's based on the request we're trying to make. And then when we get the response, we're going to store the response of that request inside the file directory using that key as the file name. And then now that we have this, the next time we make that request, We'll generate the key again, and we'll check to see if a file with this key exists already. And if it does, we're going to return that response rather than going to the network again. So with all that in mind, those steps pretty much follow the setup required to create this HTTP cache for our projects. So we create the cache directory that we want this all to be stored in. We set the maximum size for our cache. And then when this maximum size is reached, Apollo begins to remove the oldest entries. We don't have to do this. This isn't actually part of our setup. I just added this in here for understanding about what happens when we hit that maximum size. And the maximum size is something we have to define. <laughs> 
So let's look at what code we actually have to write. So we start off by creating the directory. Here I'm using the and application contacts cache directory, and then I'm telling it to create a subfolder called Apollo Cache. I'm setting my size in megabytes, so here it's one megabyte. And to get from bytes to megabytes, we have to do 1024 by 1024 by one. Um, I like to split out that 1024 into constants, so I can say bytes per kilobyte times kilobytes per megabyte time, and then the number of megabytes I want, which is one. Um, you don't need to do this for Apollo. It's kind of like a tangent, but I find this really helpful. Um, sometimes you will see in samples, people write 1024 times 1024 times one. Um, I find that hard to read. It's easy to forget what 1024 represents. So this was just a side plug. Definitely consider constants like these if you go to build this cache. Once we have that, we create our disk LRU HTTP cache store. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the acronym LRU, it stands for least recently used, which is a fancy way of saying oldest. Um, so that's why we had that note in our previous slide that when our limit is reached, Apollo begins to remove the oldest entries or the least recently used entries. And then we return the Apollo HTTP cache from there. Once we've created this cache, all we have to do is, on our Apollo client builder, call the HTTP cache builder method and pass this in. One more step. So, now that we've added the cache, this will run and compile, but it won't actually do anything for us yet, um, because we need to tell our application if it should use the cache or not and how to use it. And we do that through an HTTP cache policy. We have four policies we can set for this. We can set network only, which will say this call should not care about the cache. It should just talk to the network, get a response, return that. Um, we have cache only, which will say go to the cache. If it's there, great. If it's not, it fails. Or we have network first and cache first. What network first does is it goes to the network, sees if it can get a response. If not, it will try to read from cache. And cache first is the other way. It checks, do we have something in cache? Yes, return that. No, go to the network. And we have two different ways that we can set our cache policy. The first one is setting a default on our Apollo client. We call the default HTTP cache policy builder method. And then this cache policy gets set to all of the queries that our Apollo client makes. Or if we want to set it on a query by query basis, we can do it right on the uh, query object that Apollo creates for us. Um, yeah, get our query, call to builder, set the cache policy, build, and now further down, you can do whatever you need to do to run that query and handle the response. Um, and the next thing we might need to think about in terms of this cache is how do we invalidate it? So there's, I say, three different ways that we could do this, and which one you use depends on um, your use case and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, but here's what they are. So first, you can set an expiration policy. So we can set our cache to expire um, after one hour. So if I make an, uh, the same request within an hour, we'll return that. Otherwise, we treat it as invalid, and then eventually we need to go to the network and get the latest data again. Um, we could choose to expire after read. So it will basically just go to the cache one time. And once it does, it expires it. The next time we try to read from cache, we're going to need to update it. Or if something happens, then we have clients have control over this, and we just want to invalidate everything. We can get our Apollo client and just call clear HTTP cache, and it will ax everything for us. And I mentioned at the beginning of this, when we talked about the HTTP cache, that it was easier to set up, but it had some limitations. Let's talk about what those limitations are. Um, if multiple operations request similar information, the HTTP cache will store it twice. So in our sample app, we have one request that loads all of the countries and one request that loads detailed information about a country. Even though they're similar information, they're two different requests, so the HTTP cache will store them as two files. 
one file is going to have all of the country information, and the other file is going to have detailed information about one country. So if I click on a bunch of different countries, soon I'm going to have a lot of different files inside this cache directory, um, and no way to relate them to each other. We also cannot observe changes to the HTTP cache. So if I were to like overwrite a file or remove a file or something like that, there's no way for us to observe those changes uh, client side. And it also does not work well with HTTP post requests. So out of the box, the cache, the HTTP cache will only work for queries, not for something like mutations. Um, I've heard that this is possible, that if you really, really need this, it can be done, um, but it's very complex and it's not something that comes built into Apollo. Um, so that's the HTTP cache. Quick to set up, quick to use, um, but it has some limitations. And if those limitations that we just talked about are concerns for you and things you need to solve in your application, then it might help to look into the normalized cache. Now, the normalized cache stores information by ID, and this allows us to relate responses from different queries to each other. And within that, we have two types of normalized caches. We have our in-memory normalized cache, which is just going to store things in memory when we create it, and it basically if you use a singleton, it will live as long as your application does. Whenever the user kills the application, we lose all that information in the cache. And the second one is a SQLite database, in which case all the responses are persisted in the database and they stay on device. So that if I kill the app or restart my phone, um, that information is still there for us to pull from the cache next time. We'll walk through first how we create our in-memory normalized cache. And really, there's just two steps to this one. Um, we define our eviction policy, which is when things should be evicted from this in-memory cache, and well, then we create it. Um, so let's look at that in code. To create the eviction policy, um, we call eviction policy.builder, and then we have a few different customizations we can make. We can set the max size of this cache in bytes, so whenever we reach that max size, we start to remove things. Um, we can say that after accessing the cache, we expire it after a certain time interval. Same thing after writing. So we can write it, say that it expires in an hour, um, or we can set max entries. And we can mix and match these different things if we want. Once we've determined the eviction policy that's best for our use case, we create an LRU normalized cache factory and then we apply that onto our Apollo client using the normalized cache method on the builder. The SQLite cache is even easier to set up because we just call the built-in SQL, SQL normalized cache factory method. We give it our application context. We give it a name for the database. And then again, we apply that onto our Apollo client builder, and we're good to go to start using this cache. Now, you might be wondering what's the difference between an in-memory cache and a SQLite. Or we talked about it, but why would I use one over the other? And that's because you might prefer the in-memory cache because reading from memory, your random access memory, is a lot faster than going to the disk. Um, but it comes with the consequence of not persisting data versus the SQLite one can persist data, but it's a little bit slower. But we can actually chain caches together to get the best of both approaches. So we can create our in-memory cache, we can create our SQLite cache, and then we can call in-memory cache.chain SQLite cache, and now our Apollo client will use both. And the chain will go in this order. So we'll first try to see if we have something in memory, which is faster. And if we don't, then we go to our SQLite database, and in theory, if we don't have it there, then we go to the network. But it's always trying the fastest route and looking for ways to save time and resources for the user. Um, so this is really great. I encourage you to set up both, get the best of both approaches, but ultimately decide what's best for your use case. And 
much like the HTTP cache where we had our HTTP cache policy, we can define um, custom response fetchers for each um, query that interacts with the normalized cache. So we can have cache only and network only. We could go cache first or network first. Um, or Apollo response fetchers actually gives us an additional one, which is cache and network. And the way this one works in short is it goes to the cache, gets that information, returns that, but then it also makes a network request, updates the cache, and then returns what came back from the network. Um, I linked to the docs because if you use this, it's important to understand the different edge cases. What if the cache fails? What if the network fails? Their documentation is really good about explaining um, the order of operations, um, for lack of a better phrase, in that example. And just like at the HTTP cache, we have two ways of setting a response fetcher. A global one by using default response fetcher on the Apollo client, or setting it per call by taking the query, creating a new builder, setting the response fetcher there. So just giving that a second. I know there was a lot of code, um, but it's really just those two blocks. Set up default for the client, set it per call. Um, so now let's talk about, now that we have our normalized cache, um, I think it's a helpful exercise to walk through how we would debug and optimize this cache. Um, how do we make sure it's working the way we want? How could we make it work even better? So one way to do that is by adding a logger on our Apollo client. So I linked to this at the bottom with the newest Apollo library, 2.5.2 there was a new file added to the Apollo Android support artifact, which gives us this class called Apollo Android Logger, which takes events from Apollo and prints them in the Android log cat. We can set this on our Apollo client, and then anytime there's important information from our Apollo client, things like cache information, they will get printed to the log cat for us. Um, so this is really helpful for debugging. So, Let's walk through an example where I would use this log cat to make sure our application is working the way I want it. So in our application, we have a list of countries that load on the main screen. And when I click on them, I see the detailed information. Using the normalized cache, I should expect that when I click on a country, um, I would be able to pull from cache. So how do we verify that that's happening? Well, here, we have the app loads up. This is expected. We have cache miss for operation country list query. But then when we clicked on a country list item, I noticed in the log cat that it said cache miss for operation country detail query. And so I'm wondering, you know, was this miss expected? It might make sense. So the reason the first one was expected is I'm loading the app for the first time. There's nothing in cache. There's no way to pull the country list. But when I click on an item, I didn't expect this to miss because even though it's a new request, we're using the normalized cache, I should be able to find the country because it was requested on the first page, um, but it wasn't there. And I learned that by adding the logger onto our Apollo client. Um, and this is unexpected. I kind of talked about this already. We would expect using the normalized cache that the detailed screen would be able to find the information it needs. So let's try to find out why that didn't happen. Um, well, another piece of helpful information from the log cat um, was this cache miss exception. Missing value country for record, and then it gives me some detailed information. So it sounds like according to Apollo, it was unable to find the record we wanted to display on a detailed screen. So I want to try and figure out why it couldn't find that record. And my first option for looking into this is to print the normalized cache. This is a really helpful debugging tool that Apollo gives us. We can get our Apollo client, call Apollo store, normalized cache dump. This will take everything in our normalized cache and give it to us. Then we can call this helper method printify dump, which takes everything in the cache and prints it out into a nice JSON structure so we can see what's there. And then once I have that nice JSON string, I print that into our log cat. And here is what it looks like. 
So I see kind of what's in the optimistic normalized cache, what's in the LRU normalized cache. In this example, they were both empty, but I do have stuff in our SQL normalized cache. And I used command F in the logcat to try and find Andorra, which was the country I clicked on. And I can see here we have countries.0, type name country, code AD, name Andorra. It's there. It's in our normalized cache. Um, but for some reason, we were unable to find it when we went to the detailed screen. So my hunch was, let's see if it's somewhere else in the logs after I have clicked on the detailed screen, right? And sure enough, I found the record again after I made the detailed screen. And if you are uh, eagle-eyed in the audience, you've noticed immediately something is very different about this. They had different identifiers. We had countries.0 in the first example, and in the other one we had country with like this JSON inside for the code. So it was the same information, but they had different keys within our cache. And so that's why Apollo was unable to find it. There's more on this later. Before we talk about why they were different and how we solved that, we're going to talk about another way that we could have debugged this. And that's using the database inspector. So if you're going to leverage the SQL normalized cache and you're using Android Studio, we now have a database inspector for looking into SQLite databases on the device that will help us a ton. Um, and debugging these issues. So here, I just opened the Database Inspector tab. I clicked on Apollo DB, the records table, and I immediately noticed this key column, and I can see the keys for each country. And you'll notice the pattern we saw earlier. It's countries.0 and then .continent, or countries.0, and that's because continent is like a nested object, so it's stored as a different entry inside our normalized cache. And to go a step further, to use this database inspector um, for testing the country that we're trying to click on, we can set up a new query, click on this icon over here on the left, type in the query we want. So I want to select everything from the records table where it contains the text Andorra. And I can also see here, I had two different keys, but the record was all the same information. So the database inspector is really helpful to see what's in the cache, help you inspect, you know, if an entry is in there twice or what information is in the cache for a specific entry. Um, definitely leverage this new tool. I'm so grateful to the uh, developer experience team at Google who built this for us. <laughs> um, so let's go back to the actual problem that this helped us identify. Why was the key different? Well, by default, Apollo uses the field path as the key which is why we saw countries.number, because the initial query was called countries, and the number that followed it was basically the index of the country um, in the response. And that was different for the detail query, because the query name is country, and then we pass arguments into that query, we pass the country code to get detail by code, and so that's how that path was created. Um, but if we want to change this, if we want to set the key ourselves so that we can leverage the normalized cache better, we need to supply our own cache key resolver. And here is what the cache key resolver looks like. And there's two methods that we need to implement each time. The first one is from field arguments. From field arguments is called when our query is run. We use this to resolve any arguments to the key that we want to find. So in our sample app, when I view the detailed screen, this method is going to be called. And it's going to say, I have some arguments to look up a country by code. Can I take those arguments and convert them into a cache key so that I can see if this exists in the cache? The second method from field record set is called when an operation returns. And we use this to take the response and convert it into a cache key we want to save. So in this case, we get like all of our countries from the country list query, and this is gonna be called with each one and say, when I take this, you know, how do I create like a code um, or a cache key uh, to save it as, so it can be looked up later. And we'll look at these methods one by one. Um, ah, well, also important to know, 
when I create a cache key resolver, the way we tell our client to use it is when we create a normalized cache, we pass it there. So when we have from field record set, what we're going to do is each of our entities, a country or a continent, has a property called code. So we're going to get the code from the record set. Then on the next line, we're also going to get the type name, which is going to be either country or continent. We're going to use this as a prefix. And then our cache key, we're going to set it as type prefix dot code. And it's a little hard to visualize you know, what that um, means, but this is what it's going to look like in our cache now. We're going to have continent.eu, that's for Europe. We're going to have country.ad, that's for Andorra. Now we have a cache key that is much more specific and becomes a lot easier to look up in the future. And to do that lookup properly, we need to override from field arguments. And what we can do is check specifically when we're querying for a country, in this example, we're going to get the code property by calling resolve argument with code and then set the full ID by doing country dot the code. And then we're going to return that cache key. And we can only do this for the country case. Um, in this example, um, if you don't know what cache key to use, you can return cache key that no key, and it will try to resolve with the default if it can. Um, otherwise, it won't be able to. But I don't know that code is going to be relevant for every query, so I do this as a way to make sure that I'm keeping it explicit. And so now we run the app. When I load the app, I get a miss, which is expected. I don't have a country list. But now when I clicked on an item, I see cache hit for operation, country detail query. So now by leveraging the cache key resolver, telling it what key to store in the cache, and then also telling it how to get that key to look up from the cache, I can start using it right away. So effectively, I've created an app that goes to the network only once when it loads the main country page. And when I click on each detail after that, um, I'm able to pull from the cache. So this is really great. It creates a really good user experience, but it's also important to remember this will only work if the detail page is requesting the same or potentially fewer fields than the main screen. If the cache doesn't have the properties we need, then this will have to go to the network because it can't resolve it from the cache. But when it gets that, it will update a normalized cache, and so the next time it should work, unless you decide to expire information and things like that. And we can also respond to cache changes. This was something I talked about earlier. This is just a small note at the end. Um, if we leverage the coroutine or RxJava adapters that Apollo offers, um, we can take our query and call like two flow or two flowable in RxJava. And then we can observe multiple changes um, or observe any changes to our cache without having to make new queries. This is really helpful in the... Um, response fetcher that we talked about earlier uh, for Apollo response fetchers dot cache and network. So if we apply this response fetcher and then we convert something to a flow and we call collect, this will emit twice, once with the information that came from the cache and once with the information that came from the network. So I hope that was helpful to teach you everything you need to know about the Apollo cache, um, the HTTP cache, how to use it, what its limitations are, um, the benefits of the normalized cache, uh, difference between in-memory and SQLite, and then also how to debug that normalized cache. Uh, so if you have any questions, if you're watching this live, hopefully I'm able to answer them in the Twitch chat. Um, otherwise, please reach out to me on Twitter. My DMs are open. You can also just publicly tweet at me. That's the fastest way to reach me. And then this link also is to a sample project that has all of the different caching involved, and I'll put some documentation together that helps everyone understand what's happening and uh, resources for uh, digging into caching. So I hope you found this helpful. I hope you take this and go create some great user experiences in your application. And thank you for listening.